Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Melanie Dizon. I'm the Director of Education at the Davis Finney Foundation. And today we are here to talk about physical therapy and Parkinson's. And I'm super excited to have our three panelists with us, Lee Dibble, Gammon Earhart, and Terry Ellis. Uh, these three have been with the foundation for a very long time, actually. And they started, um, we, we funded some of their early research called the CHOP PD study that charted the progression of disability and Parkinson's. And it found that individuals who do not engage in physical activity in the first two years following a Parkinson's diagnosis actually have a steeper decline in quality of life than those who do exercise or engage in some sort of physical activity. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that research study and a whole lot more in just a second. Uh, but I wanna start with a quick tutorial for Zoom in case this is one of your first uh, webinars with Zoom. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you will see a little icon that says chat. If you click that, uh, a little box will pop up to the right and you will see a blue button uh, to the bottom of the screen and it will probably say all panelists and attendees. If you wanna um, sh ask a question during the webinar, you can type it in the chat. If you want everybody to see that question, then you'll wanna keep all panelists and attendees selected. If you only want the panelists to see it, then just make sure you select just the panelists. Um, in terms of questions, it's really helpful if you ask questions that are a little more universal in nature because um, our experts here are definitely experts, but they are not experts on you. And so it's difficult for them to provide very specific information on your case, uh, just because they don't know you. So they can ask, answer more general questions. So feel free to answer those or ask those. Um, if you already sent them to me ahead of time, you do not need to resend them to me through the chat because I do have all of those um, available to me. Um, after this session is over, you will receive the recording of the video, the recording of the audio, and a transcript. So as long as you are registered, and if you are sitting here listening to me right now, it means you're registered and you will get those recordings as soon as they are available. If you have any sort of technical question, you can drop it in the chat right now. Uh, we have several people from the Davis Finney Foundation who will be available to answer those. Um, Okay, I think I'm gonna get going. We have a lot to do today. I'm gonna to do some introductions. So Lee Dibble uh, received a BS degree in animal physiology from UC Davis and an MS degree in physical therapy from Duke University. He received his PhD in exercise and sports science with a focus on motor learning and motor control in 2001. And he's been a certified athletic trainer since 1989 and a licensed physical therapist since 1991. He has worked at the Duke University Sports Medicine Center in a student sports injury clinic um, and as an athletic trainer for the United States Soccer Federation, as an athletic trainer and physical therapist for the 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City, and as a physical therapist at the University of Utah Sports Medicine Center. His research focuses on exercise and motor learning countermeasures to combat postural instability and balance disorders. Since 2016, Lee has served as a professor in the Department of Physical Therapy and Athletic Training at the University of Utah. You can see his little icon, his little logo on the top of the screen. Um, Terry Ellis is an associate professor at Boston University College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. Um, Sargent College and the Department of Physical Therapy and Athletic Training. Her research focuses on investigating the impact of exercise and rehabilitation on the progression of disability in individuals with Parkinson's. She's also the director of the Center for Neuro Rehabilitation at Boston University, where she conducts research, provides clinical consultations and education to healthcare professionals and to persons with neurological disorders. In addition, she directs the American Parkinson's Disease Association National Rehabilitation Resource Center housed at Boston University. She has a PhD in behavioral neurosciences from Boston University School of Medicine and is a board certified specialist in neurologic physical therapy. And finally, we have Gammon Earhart. She's a physical therapist and neuroscientist. After graduating from Oxford, she attended Arcadia University and earned her Bachelor of Arts in Psychobiology and a Master of Science in Physical Therapy. Upon completion of her physical therapy training, she enrolled in the Movement Science PhD program at Washington University in St. Louis. She studied nervous system control of movement, focusing on how the spinal cord and brain control walking. She earned her PhD in 2000 and then pursued a postdoctoral fellowship at Oregon Health and 
Science University. As a postdoctoral fellow, she studied how people adapt their walking patterns to meet environmental challenges and how damage to the brain or inner ear impacts ability to adapt walking patterns. She directs two research laboratories, the Locomotor Control Laboratory and the Physical Activity Research Center. Her work focuses primarily on Parkinson's and the ranges from basic neuroimaging studies aimed at understanding neural control of movement to clinical trials that compare the effect of different forms of exercise on physical function and Parkinson's progression. So in the event that you were wondering if we had experts in this field to talk about all of these things, now you know you definitely have the right three people. So I'm very excited to talk to all of you today and I know our community is. Um, what I'd love to do first, Ter uh, Lee actually, is to go back to the research um, and the CHOP PD study. Uh, first, can you talk about what the study was, what you were hoping to find, and then where we are now in terms of what we know about Parkinson's and physical therapy? Sure, uh, thank you again for inviting us. We uh, uh, feel honored to, to be part of the webinar. So uh, when we first began talking to the uh, Davis Finney Foundation, I think, and Gammon and Terry, you can correct me if I'm wrong, 2009-ish maybe uh, about the uh, CHOP PD study, we were, uh, as physical therapists, uh, we joked that we had a biased view of exercise. We felt like it was of, of benefit, but we felt like there wasn't a good natural history study of how people progressed and potentially uh, accumulated more disability. And we wanted to be able to document that to lay the groundwork for subsequent exercise trials that would show that um, that exercise and physical activity did something different than, uh, than just doing uh, no activity. Uh, and I think that we were able to, to provide a nice uh, uh, documentation of that kind of, that progression of disability. And some of the most exciting things I think that came out of that study were some of the stuff that Terry led, uh, looking at kind of uh, a sense of a person's self-efficacy or a belief that the physical activity and exercise would help them uh, and that that uh, predicted whether or not they would exercise and if they would uh, improve, potentially have uh, some improvement from that exercise. And uh, that and then also some technical uh, measurements of people's walking ability in the community to me, those are two of the most exciting things that came out of that trial. And I think it served as a nice foundation for the subsequent studies that I've done, that Gammon has done, Terry has done, and others also. I don't know, Terry if, and Gammon, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I think that study was it really, like you just said, Lee, set, it set the, provided some nice um, foundational work in which we've all built off of over time. And, you know, subsequently, many, many more exercise trials have been done showing the true benefits of exercise in mitigating symptoms and improving function in people with Parkinson's disease. So I think that was some of the early work that, you know, sort of laid, you know, uh, provided the groundwork, you know, for subsequent studies that have been done, um, you know, in which we're, we know now, <laughs> you know, that exercise is very beneficial. And now we're sort of digging down to the nuances more about really trying to understand what's happening in the brain, you know, what's uh, understanding the mechanisms by which exercise works. Um, and, you know, and a lot of people with Parkinson's have questions about which kind of exercise and how much exercise and all those kinds of things that I'm sure we'll get to, you know, later today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to do just a quick poll to kind of see who's listening and uh, what their experience has been. So um, this is for people with Parkinson's. Uh, the question is, how long do you have, how long did you have a diagnosis of Parkinson's before you began working with a physical therapist? And there's a variety of different, uh, it's a multiple choice. You can choose one thing. Just want to see if it's um, some people, was it the first thing that they did? For some people, they still haven't done it yet. So just want to get a sense of who we're listening to or who's listening to the webinar um, and then we can tailor some of the questions for for that um, just give it about 10 more seconds and then I'll share share the results of the poll um, Mel yeah. I, just, I just wanted to uh, add one that last thing with regards to the CHOP PD study that was a study that we felt like was really kind of uh, 
important to do and it was not something that uh, a national federal funding agency would have funded so we feel very fortunate that the the davis finney foundation and the parkinson's disease foundation at that point uh invested in that in that project so we owe well, a, a debt of gratitude for that so. yeah well we owe a debt of gratitude to you for sure um that's a that's a big part of our mission here is uh teaching people what what they can do so that was a big a big result for us as well. So um, we have about 12% of the people said it was the one, a PT was one of the first people they called. So congrats to you um, and whoever your doctors were that um, decided that was a great suggestion to give you. Some people uh, actually 23% have never met with a physical therapist since their diagnosis, which I think is quite common. Um, and then I would say the, mo the majority of um, other ones are sort of spread out between those other three. So we will talk a lot about why why it's important to to work with a physical therapist. So, um, Gammon, can I and I ask this to you? So, what is why is it so important for someone to see a physical therapist soon after diagnosis? I think the sooner somebody can see a physical therapist, the better, because it allows a relationship to be established and sort of a, a, an initial assessment to be performed to determine whether or not the person is currently exercising what sort of concerns they're facing in terms of their movement, as well as things not related to movement that might be impacting them. Maybe things related to mood or, you know, difficulty doing certain daily life activities, those types of things. And then figuring out what physical therapy approaches are optimal for that person at that time and starting those early. Because one of the things that we found in the CHOP study was that a very sensitive measure of how well somebody was doing was how much walking they continued to do. In fact, that measure was more sensitive than some of the things that would typically be considered sort of gold standards to measure how somebody's doing. So I think, you know, that just speaks volumes to the importance of movement. And even if you're very early on and you really don't feel like you've had much difficulty, there's still a role for physical therapists in determining sort of a, a regular exercise routine to maintain current level of improve current level of function. So I think starting exercise as one of the key elements in living well with Parkinson's right from the get-go can really help to, to set the stage and uh, prevent subsequent declines or at least delay them. Right. Um, Terry, can you speak a little bit about what um, a Parkinson's, what an assessment might look like for somebody who's newly diagnosed that, that comes in to see a PT? Sure. Uh, I think, the, you know, if people think about when you go to the neurologist, the neurologist does a lot of these tests like this and like this, and they're looking at things like slowness and stiffness and tremor. And what a physical therapist does is spend more time, we might look at that also, but spend more time looking at walking, walking speed, for example, walking endurance, um, things like balance you know, uh, how well somebody can balance under different conditions when they reach forward or when somebody nudges them. For example, we look more at activities of daily living. We have all kinds of questionnaires in which we look at how people are functioning in their everyday life. We look at quality of life across different domains. And so these are things that a neurologist uh, you know, may not, uh, you know, have the time for and uh, doesn't specifically focus on. And I think what physical therapists do is take a step back and look at someone's overall function. How are they doing in everyday life? I think one way to think about it, we all, all three of us, talk about the, what we call a secondary prevention model or a dental model. You know, I think people, we call it a dental model because people understand and can resonate with what you do with a dentist. You know, with a dentist, you go, you always go to the dentist, you go for a baseline, you go when you're healthy, you go when everything is good. And, uh, you know, they do a nice cleaning and they do some x-rays, they figure out if you have any problems. And, you know, the best thing that can happen is the dentist says, you look great, everything's all set, right? No problems. But then you go back to the dentist in six months, right? Whether you have a problem or not, or a year or whatever it is. And you have these regular follow-ups you know, kind of like you go back to the neurologist every six months or so for a medication adjustment and they do the same tests. 
Well, when you go back to a physical therapist, they do the same test, the walking, the balance, the quality of life, right? And then, you know, like Gammon was saying, they, uh, you know, we can, we can determine based on the data we collected with the Davis Finney Foundation, we can determine, did the change that occurred over six months, was that just a little bit? Is that expected? Is that a lot, right? And, and by collecting that very standardized data every six months or so, we know how people are doing. And then we can develop an exercise program tailored to that person's needs. The exercise program is personalized based on the problems that that you know, patient is challenged by. And then we continue to monitor that over the course of the disease. You know, We see people over the course of their, a lifetime every six months or annually or so, so that we, we understand what's going on and we can, we can make the best difference. Great, I love, I love that dental uh, analogy. So um, I, I'll, you know, we frequently have people, you know, in the, in the chat is why would I, if I'm exercising, why do I need a PT? And I think that we can go back to that dental analogy. I'm sure all of us have had that experience of we think everything's fine. Like our teeth were fine. We're going to, but we go into the dentist and they're like, oh, there's a cavity forming or there's this, even if you don't feel it, it's there. And so the reason why we have a PT is because those ex, those tests, those assessments are going to get to somewhere that we can't get to on our own. And they're going to help us um, help you over time say, oh, well, I need to fill the cavity. Okay. Now we need to walk, w work a little bit on core strength because of such and such, right? right so right. I really love that idea. Um, and also in terms of, I think one of the things that people worry about is if I go to see a PT, I can't, I can't go to a PT three times. I'm, I'm too busy. I have this, I'm working, I'm doing all of those kinds of things. And you brought up, maybe you go every six months, maybe you go every year and the PT is going to work with you. They're not going to say, oh, you got to come three times a week if you don't need it, that that's not what their goal is. So um, thank you for, for sharing that. I think that's relieving to people who are, haven't seen a PT, but want to. Lee, do you have, uh, want to share uh, in? Just from a, uh, a, a collaboration standpoint, I think that we all uh, have collaborations with community programs and we're advocates for some community programs in conjunction with a the physical therapy visit, if that works better for people. Um, and, and also, uh, certainly within the United States, Sometimes the PT ends up being the first person that, uh, that a patient might be referred to, but the patient's needs extend beyond or are different than what we can provide care for. So we have strong working relationships with occupational therapists that might be able to help an individual with more specific aspects or speech and language pathologists. Um, so I, I wouldn't wanna say that PT is the, the uh, uh, be all end all, uh, I think we have a lot to offer individuals early in the, uh, in the after diagnosis and through the disorder, but, but also kind of interprofessional practice with other, other individuals that would optimize uh, the care and the ability of the person with Parkinson's disease to optimize their function. Great. Thank you. And um, I think that, you know, somebody had said, uh, why a PT over a personal trainer? And I think we've acknowledged that, uh, you know, a P, especially a Parkinson's PT, and we'll talk a little bit about what the difference is. Um, they're going to see something that a personal trainer just was has not been trained to see. Uh, they look at things in a very different way. Uh, they've had much deeper training. Um, and so that's one of the differences. And somebody actually said, um, I'm a perfect example of why not using a physical therapist, but using a trainer is detrimental when your PD gets worse. Um, a, PD, a PT is just going to know more about the, the disease. Let's talk a little bit about a Parkinson's PT versus a just straight up PT. So what should somebody look for in somebody who's a Parkinson's PT? What's, what is the extra training they have received that makes it better? And then also, if somebody can't access somebody who is a Parkinson's PT, what are the really important questions that they ask that person to see if they're gonna be able to help them? Gammon, you wanna take that one? Yeah, I'll start off. Uh, I'd say, so every physical therapist will know a little bit 
about Parkinson's just from the basic schooling that they have in order to be a physical therapist. Um, so I would say anyone is better than no one if you're not seeing a physical therapist at all. Uh, but that being said, there are people who have additional training specifically in neurologic physical therapy and those people will hold a certification as a certified neurologic physical therapist through um, our bodies, you know, they take a, an exam that's regulated federally. And so it's an additional credential that people will have. And you can search for people who have that particular specialist certification. And then even within that group, there are people who are more specialized and know even more about Parkinson specifically, not just neurological disorders in general. And Terry actually runs a training program that she can speak to about that additional level of training that some people seek and how to find those people. Yeah, there's some, you know, just like I think people understand this a little better with doctors. You know, people understand that doctors specialize and have subspecialties. And actually, physical therapists, we, we, we sort of, our training kind of mirrors that in some ways. You know, people know that um, physicians can do a residency program and a, re and a fellowship program and become board certified. And so, one of the programs I direct is a residency program in which we train people to become, to develop expertise in treating people with Parkinson's and other neurological conditions. So they specialize in neurology, you know, just like a physician will specialize in neurology. So those people, you know, have had additional training and are more well-versed in the literature and, you know, um, are better able to to, uh, to help somebody with Parkinson's disease at sort of a higher level. Great, thank you. What, what role should aerobic strength and balance training play when it comes to living well with Parkinson's? And I think in particular, people wanna hear about, um, you know, the intensity piece, how important is that to mitigating Parkinson's symptoms? Lee. I can go ahead and start and then we'll kind of, uh, we'll all have something to say about this. I think one of the weaknesses I would find in the current uh, kind of exercise studies is that by, by research design standpoint, we put everybody into a group regardless of their, uh, their types of symptoms and they get a particular intervention. And that's kind of the strength of the research design to kind of keep it valid. But in clinical practice, everybody has a different uh, kind of brand of Parkinson's disease and they don't ha all have the same needs. So I think that's one of the, to tie back to the previous conversation we were having about what a physical therapist can do is they could look at an individual and say, oh, well, you appear to have some slowness of movement or bradykinesia that might be a product of some muscle weakness. You would respond most robustly to strength training and we should put you on a strength training program. Whereas another person might have some fatigue that might respond more to aerobic conditioning. Uh, and that person might do better with a biking or a walking program or something that would improve their cardiorespiratory endurance. Um, and then another person might have some balance problems and they might need something different uh, or might have pain and rigidity and they might need a more flexibility or yoga type program. So I think it's difficult to say this type of exercise is most beneficial. Great. Any, anyone else want to chime in on that one? You know, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of kind of um, press or um, attention on uh, high intensity exercise. And, um, you know, there's some, there's been some suggestion that uh, aerobic exercise, so the kind of exercise that gets your heart rate up there, um, you know, fast walking or cycling, stationary cycling, for example. And there was a study that came out a couple of years ago run by Margaret Shankman and Daniel Korkos. And, uh, you know, they compared a high intensity to a moderate intensity to a sort of a usual care. And the outcome that they looked at was this outcome with the slowness and the stiffness of movement, that, that test that you do every time you go to the neurologist. And what they found in that study was is it, there was some suggestion that only the high intensity group uh, showed a significant benefit over the 
usual care group. Even though the moderate intensity group improved, uh, it wasn't it wasn't as much uh, improvement over the over the usual care group. So because of this suggestion that maybe high intensity is really important, now there's a big study going on all around the country. And Lee and I and Gammon are all involved in this. Uh, Daniel Corcos is the PI, uh, the principal investigator out of Northwestern. And we're trying to figure out, okay, now we have to do a bigger study. Several hundred people are gonna be in this study. And we're going to compare that high intensity to that moderate intensity aerobic exercise to really try to better understand, you know, um, what's happening. You know, we don't fully understand if it's, you know, does it just uh, mitigate the symptoms, you know, kind of alleviate the symptoms, sort of like what the medication does, or is there something more to it? Does it actually slow down the progression of the disease? And that's really hard to figure out. It's really hard to figure out because I'm sure a lot of people on this on this um, webinar have heard about biomarkers, and you know it's really hard to measure the the changes um, you know in the brain, let's say, that are indicative of slowing uh, the disease progression. We just don't have like a really good measure of that. But you know, in this particular study, they're going to try to look at other brain measures to try to get some idea of what's happening in the brain. Um, you know, as well as what happens on this kind of a test and what happens with walking, for example, that'll also be part of it. So it's exciting. Stay tuned. Um, yeah, I think it's exciting that they are looking at things like walking. I think sometimes our community gets intimidated when they see a study that says, you know, it has to be 85% or this RPM and that RPM, and they, they feel like that's inaccessible to them. Uh, they haven't been exercising. And so um, I think that's great that they're starting to look at other, other factors as well that um, are going to help people. And I think across the board, our community is, they feel better when they move. Um, the, the caveat to that is pain the pain that comes along with having Parkinson's and for some people, the pain that results from deciding to take on an exercise program when maybe they didn't spend their life as exercisers. And so um, Gammon, can you speak a little bit about how physical therapy can help reduce pain, improve overall mobility and what are the sort of uh, triggers or clues to help people determine this is a good pain good pain. This is a pain that I should makes me stop doing this physical activity and seeking help somewhere. Yeah, so I think that's that's tricky because it's different for every individual. But I would say in general that what physical therapists can do is help to understand what the likely contributors are to the pain. So is it that somebody has arthritis and the structure of their joint? has changed in such a way that maybe you should consider an alternative exercise and not continue with something that's loading that joint repeatedly? Or is it something about the particular pattern of movement that the person is using? And if they could use a different strategy or a different pattern, learn to move in a different way that they could perform that exercise with less pain and um, less stress on the structures. I think too, um, recognizing that the pain that comes like muscle soreness, for example, after exercise should subside. You know, once you've done exercise, it's normal for it to have soreness, but it should subside over time. And that if it's something that's persisting and not going away, even when you lighten up on the exercise, that that's not a, a good sign and probably something that you wanna check in about. Um, so those would be my, my thoughts. Terry and Lee, do you have something else? One other uh, thing that I know that we end up looking at is trying to talk to the individual person with Parkinson's disease and see what the kind of time-based behavior is for their pain. Does it correspond at all to their medications? Uh, because if it's related to the rigidity, then um, it, it may subside a little bit when, they're, um, when their medications are at their best effect. Um, and then we can try to do some things to reduce as best we can the rigidity or work with their uh, referring provider to see if uh, we can, uh, they can extend the medication effect and reduce the pain associated with rigidity as a Parkinson's symptom. Great. Yeah, and I think that um, 
you know, when, when you're diagnosed with Parkinson's, it feels like this, it's all, it's, I have Parkinson's and that's the thing that I am living with. But we all come to, uh, we probably will all come to a physical therapist or a doctor with other things going on. And so part of it is like he, uh, like Lee said with the medication is, is it rigidity? Is that why the pain is, is trying to figure out what is the Parkinson's? What might be something else? Uh, what could be treated in another way that that would then allow you to do what you need to do to treat your Parkinson's? And so that's why it's super important to have uh, sort of an integrative team that's gonna be able to address those issues. One of the issues that people write in a lot about is back pain. And they're wondering if uh, there is any link between Parkinson's and back issues, maybe degenerative disc disease or things like that. It's a very frequent question we get. And we also know that back pain is very uh, common for people as they age. And so um, what, what have you seen in your practices around back pain and Parkinson's and uh, because it is something that can also can really inhibit people or make them not do anything, what are some things that you um, encourage people to do uh, when they have really severe back pain? So I can speak to that a little bit. It's 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 very tricky. First of all, I would agree that a lot of people with Parkinson's disease have back pain, but and so understanding having someone, a physical therapist with expertise. In, in orthopedics or in the spine is also really helpful to be able to sort this thing out. Figuring out what is the source of the back pain. Oftentimes there is another source that is related to some mechanical problem or some joint problem or, you know, but it's, it can be made worse or exacerbated by the Parkinson's disease, by the slowness and the stiffness. And sometimes the approach you would take to treating that back pain is different in the absence of Parkinson's disease. And sometimes some of the things you would give someone to do for that back problem might uh, you know, help somebody who doesn't have Parkinson's disease, but actually could make it worse in the context of Parkinson's. And so sometimes when we see, some, when we see people with back pain, we can understand how what they're doing is actually kind of making it worse because the Parkinson's isn't being considered. So some of the treatments have to go down a slightly different path in order to really get at um, the problem in the context of Parkinson's, which may be making it worse. Right, and I, I would assume that the same would be true for neck pain, that's a, it's just- Absolutely, a the whole spine. I mean, if you think about, I think people understand that, you know, people with Parkinson's disease are kind of can be stiff and have a lot of stiffness. That stiffness is, is, tends to be the greatest in the spine, right? People might, might notice that they don't, um, you know, they don't turn and rotate as easily as they used to, for example. A lot of kind of stiffness with turning and moving, difficulty moving in bed, you know, not turning your head as much. And that means there's more stiffness in that spine. And so that then can exacerbate a problem that's already there. Okay, so I mean, I think we, we definitely have some questions on what to do uh, if you have back issues. And I think that the, the key really is to see your own physical therapist because they're gonna be able to look at your whole record, look at maybe x-rays or MRIs or anything else that's going on with you in addition to your Parkinson's and then develop a very specific individualized therapy for you. Uh, absolutely. Great. Um, somebody had mentioned, and we actually heard this a long time ago, about back braces for people with Parkinson's. Um, is that something that you all ever recommend? Is it something that you work with or? or... I, yeah, I mean, I, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, typically if you have, if you think about this, somebody's really stiff and not moving enough, a back brace make somebody move less and hold somebody still. And that's generally kind of the opposite of the approach we want to take. We want to try to get people moving and, and moving better. Now, I'm answering this in a very generalized way. Of course, you know, it depends on the individual circumstances and the type of back problem. But in general, 
we don't recommend back braces for people with Parkinson's who have back pain. Um, we're, we're going to, we have a lot of questions and we're going to get to them for sure. Uh, I just want to address a couple more of the, the broader picture. Um, what would you say, uh, Gammon, I think you uh, alluded to this a little bit earlier, but what sort of experiences are you, do you see from people with Parkinson's around non-motor symptoms and the benefit of PT and exercise for those? Yeah, so there can be a number of non-motor symptoms associated with Parkinson's. I think a lot of people kind of overlook them. You know, you, people call Parkinson's a movement disorder. And so movement is front and center, but there definitely can be changes in mood. So maybe depression or anxiety, um, sort of apathy. There could be changes in cognitive functions. So thinking processes can change. There can be changes in bowel functions, things like constipation, for example. So um, I guess you could consider that a motor symptom though, arguably. But uh, so there is exercise, I would say some, some evidence for exercise benefits in Parkinson's to specifically address things like mood and thinking and a lot of evidence from other groups of people as well who've been studied more extensively over time. So definitely, you know, just the, the changes that come with exercise are not strictly related to movement, but can also impact these non-motor aspects. Great. Um, let's see, what, how much improvement would you say that someone can expect from working with a PT? How can you measure it? Um, and somebody's asking about, you know, what are sort of the preferred outcome measures? Um, and I think you address the different things that you talk about, but how can somebody know like this is this is working this is worth my time this is uh something i need to keep doing lee or terry you want to jump in you want to talk or? sure I, I can start and uh, uh i think we're physical therapists uh and as terry was saying earlier that uh that the neurologist's job is to, to focus on the kind of severity of the disease. Uh, one of our primary roles is to be concerned about uh, quality of life. And uh, I think that may be one of the primary outcome measures. If it's meaningful to the, the person and they feel like they're getting benefit from it, um, then that's probably the most important outcome. We could measure something in the clinic, balance or gait speed, walking speed, something like that and we could see an improvement but if if the person doesn't feel like it's meaningful in their everyday life then i'm not sure it's that important um so we would uh we'd probably uh advocate having conversation or certainly we do with our pts and our pt students to tell them find out what the goals of the individual person uh, are and then create the program designed around those individual goals. Um, I brought up two things that we think are important. Um, and another one came up earlier, pain certainly, but balance and uh, walking ability. Uh, I, I think that those are kind of more kind of activity or movement and mobility related issues. But, but again, um, quality of life and how those would improve quality of life and mobility in the community would probably be the most important outcomes. I don't know if that answers your question though. Yes, great, thanks. Um, let's see, so we have a bunch of questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna run through some of them. I know that we've definitely addressed uh, many of them throughout, uh, let's see. Um, uh, somebody said, what is the name of the study? And it's called the CHOP PD. It's just capital C-H-O-P. Um, and if actually, if you go to our website and you click on and you just hit search CHOP study, um, that will come up, that funded research, and you'll get to see uh, that and then all the articles that are related to that. Um, Jay Alberts, yes, the research on cycling and PD, uh, we have a lot of on our site about that. You can definitely uh, look at that. Um, somebody said, why PT as opposed to personal training, rock steady boxing, walking and biking? And it's not one or the other it's uh, using them in conjunction. Um, so, you know, like, like they just said, um, depending upon what's going on with you, if you have uh, a certain issue, they might say, hey, 
boxing is totally fine for you, where they might say, actually, swimming might be better because uh, for whatever reason. So it's not one or the other, it's um, having them work together. Several people have asked about where to find a Parkinson's PT in their area. Actually, we will send you the link for sure on um, in the show notes, but we also have a site that says, where do I find a Parkinson's PT on our website? If you search that, you will find the post and then on the information on how to find that. Um, a couple of people have asked about, uh, um, well, I'm, I'm not gonna sp speak specifically about different exercises. Again, I think you can definitely talk to your doctor about that. Some people have said a lot of their access to PTs have been cut because of COVID. And so they haven't been able to see their PT. Um, do you all have any uh, recommendations for where people can go if they are homebound, they're not leaving their house, their PT doesn't offer Zoom? What are some things that people have been doing? to kind of get the help that they need, at least the um, suggestions for activities and that kind of thing? You know, um, because of now many PTs are, are providing, te uh, you know, services through telemedicine. And that allows you to go further than your just your local area. And so you don't, you know, normally if you're going in person, you'd be looking at something, well, what's close to me, you know, that I can easily get to, but you can widen you know, you can widen your search to find a physical therapist with expertise in Parkinson's disease who's delivering that care via telemedicine because they could be hundreds of miles away and, and zoom in and, you know, and help you right in your own home. You know, so uh, we're doing more telemedicine work now than we actually did in person because people are so interested in, you know, coming, uh, you know, just not don't want to leave their house. It's too risky. And never mind, just things like inconvenience and, you know, just the convenience of staying in your home and being able to access that expertise, whether it's a physician or a physical therapist or some other, you know, healthcare professional. So I think that telemedicine is an option for many, many people now, whereas that wasn't before. And now insurance companies are covering that, at least right now. We, we're hoping that that lasts and that you know they they make permanent changes in their reimbursement policies but right now it's covered uh with for many insurance companies um so medicare and some private ones great um what about so some people have asked about first of all the name of the study that you are involved with now the bigger study does that have a does it have a name right now It's, it's the, secret. No one's going to well, tell. It, it, there's a, the acronym is the SPARKS-3 trial. Um, yes. I need to remember what that all stands for. But people, we're just getting uh, all the regulatory sort of background things you have to do to get a study up and running. That's all going on now. And so the, the, the sites around the country are going to start recruiting and enrolling, I would say, later this fall or early next year. And so, you know, you can get on that. Uh, you can, uh, on the North Northwestern University's website, I, I don't actually know if this is live. So it is live, I just saw it. Okay. I think it is, I think it is. I was looking for something about it. Yeah, so if, you know, but if you, if you look at Sparks 3 is the name of it, um, you can at least get your name on a list, you know, so that when the time comes to uh, start enrolling, that you'll, you know, somebody can call you and, and, and do a formal screening to see if you're eligible and all of that. Yeah, so definitely keep a keep an eye on that. We will probably be um, sharing some information on it too on our website. Um, it's a pretty giant study and pretty exciting. I would uh, say about that study that it's for people who've never taken medicine to treat their Parkinson's. So a lot of people may not be eligible because of that. Um, Somebody asked about what's going on in the brain. What did you learn about what's going on in the brain um, through vigorous exercise that could uh, relate to the progression, stopping the progression of Parkinson's? Anyone? Are we too, are we too early on? No, I would say we don't have great evidence from people because there are a lot of things we can't manipulate and can't measure in people, but there have been a number of animal studies and those studies show that sometimes the nerve cells make different connections and new connections 
based on the activity that the animal has been engaged in. Sometimes the um, cells produce different chemicals like BDNF, which is a, a chemical that helps to promote the health of nerve cells. Um, sometimes new blood vessels are formed in the different areas of the brain to help supply the nutrients to that area in a, a more substantial way. So there are lots of different things. There are also in some animal models of Parkinson's seems to be some sparing of nerve cells so that they don't degenerate and die like they would in the absence of exercise. So there seem to be a lot of different possibilities. And again, I would say that we don't really know for sure what happens in people. It could be any or all of those things. It could also be an increase in the ability of the body to use the dopamine that's available most efficiently, sort of make better use of it than if you didn't exercise. But those are all speculative based on what we've seen in animal models. Okay, thanks. Um, fatigue is a big issue for sure for people with Parkinson's in general. And then also when you add the exercise onto that. So what are um, sort of related to pain when you have somebody that's complaining of a lot of fatigue, when do you know that, okay, this, this fatigue is like a different type of fatigue versus like you can exercise your way out of fatigue. That's, that can happen a lot of times. So what, what, do you, what is your advice uh, for people that come to you and are just saying, I'm too tired or I feel too tired to exercise? That's a really common question. It's a really good question. Um, so some people feel like, some people come and they say, I think the exercise is making me worse or, you know, making the fatigue worse. Or others will say, I'm not sure, you know, should I be doing more? Should I do less? And so it's really tricky. The, the studies that have been done on the, the effects of exercise on fatigue are, are, there's not that many of them and they have variable results. So it sort of gets back to Lee's point. If you kind of have a lot of a lot of variability in the people that are in the study, it's hard to really understand it in the depth that we want to understand it. So how we handle this is a more is when we see somebody in the clinic and we prescribe an exercise program, or if they're already doing one, we kind of more systematically look at the influence of the fatigue on the influence of the exercise on the fatigue for them. Like we do things like have them keep a log, like you know, when their fatigue is worse and better during the course of the day, when did they exercise? We might be able to uh, improve the fatigue by exercising before it comes on, let's say. Uh, you know, if we know that fatigue is worse during a certain time of day. So it's a very sort of personalized approach of figuring out how, you know, when does that person have fatigue? Is it related to their medications? Is it related to a certain time of day? You know, how can we manipulate the exercise to discover, try to understand whether it's making it better or worse or the same? And, and, and maybe we have to do a different type of exercise or a different dose of exercise to try to really uh, get a handle on, on whether we can improve that fatigue. But it's a very much a trial and error individualized approach for each person. I think one of the things that we've learned from our uh, our experience with people with multiple sclerosis is that there's a uh, fatigue just doesn't mean one thing. It's it's not just kind of muscular or metabolic fatigue from from over exercising, but there can be kind of neurologic or brain nervous system caused uh, origins of fatigue. So to kind of re reemphasize what Terry said, it's important to understand the nature of an individual's fatigue and where it's coming from to try to address it most positively for that person. And I would just add too that another strategy is to chunk your exercise rather than trying to go at it for 30 minutes at a time. You can do 10 minutes three times during the day and still get benefit, you know, so that can help if you are feeling fatigued that you may be able to do more if you do it in smaller chunks. Great, thank you. And several people have commented that they do PT via telemedicine and it's great. Um, and they're having really great results and you don't necessarily have to be in person. And, and even with an assessment, you know, somebody can 
you know, depending upon where you are, if you are in danger of falling in your home, like you could have somebody with you, uh, but you can certainly do some seated exercises and your PT can help you and make sure that you're safe while you're, while you're doing those things. But it's definitely worth checking out. Um, it seems like a lot of people have had a lot of success with it. Um, let's see, that's, uh, what value is PT when the patient will not practice exercises at home? Um, I think this is a very common question that we get from care partners. And um, I also get a lot of questions from care partners and say, you know, we have all this evidence. My person with Parkinson's has been told and they still don't want to do it. Um, any, any thoughts there? I, I do think that there's uh, a problem nationally for people with and without Parkinson's disease about being physically active and, uh, and wanting to exercise. The added layer of challenge for people with Parkinson's is that there's some potentially non-motor symptoms like Gammon talked about, like apathy and depression that may be associated with the disease. So it's kind of unrealistic to expect that you should that the doctor should be able to hand a prescription to the person and say, be physically active, and that person's going to be able to sustain that. So I view it as a physical therapist and maybe a uh, in partnership with a community program, it's their responsibility to try to provide something that, that is motivating and enjoyable. And it doesn't feel like the dreaded E word exercise, like I don't wanna do that, um, that, but they actually look forward to. Um, so I, I view that we, that we have to take into account uh, those limitations that may be organic to, to Parkinson's to try to help uh, in the process. Great. Were you going to say something, Terry? Uh, yeah, I mean, just along these lines. I mean, it's 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 hard. You know, it's hard to exercise. It's hard to exercise every day for people who don't have Parkinson's. But you know what? It, you know what? If you think about, if you just decide, oh, you know, you wake up, you wake up in the morning, and you say, oh, I'm, you know, I should exercise, right? You know, you should exercise, but you're like, oh, you know. I'm tired. I don't feel like it. I'm, you know, and so kind of one of the things we try to uh, encourage people to do is to schedule it. So you don't like thinking about it so much, you know, like, just like you sked, you know, you, you, you make it a habit and you do it at the certain same time every day, for example, just like you have a meeting, you have a meeting, it's in your calendar, you show up and you do it. And, uh, you know, the more something is a habit, like brushing your teeth, it seems like it's not so effortful. You just do it. It's part of the daily routine. And so thinking about it like that, or every day at this time is what I do, you know? And back to Lee's point, it's, it's gotta be something enjoyable. There's so many options for exercise that's beneficial. That's a good thing. It allows people to choose. And then uh, one of Lee's comments was community exercise programs. I think, People will drive an hour and a half to go to an exercise program and drive back because when they get there, it's not so hard. You just go along with whatever the instructor is doing. You just you just do it. You know you're going to do it, and you know on the other end of it, you're going to feel good. Um, I mean, I think that's one reason why boxing is so popular. You go you go there, you get a lot of encouragement, you get a lot of camaraderie, and it makes it easier. It's not so difficult to do when there's some enjoyment. Uh, you know, as part of the process. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of people mentioned like a partner. Yes. If you've got somebody waiting for you, it's really hard not to show up. So. Exactly. Exactly. Like make it, make it easier, you know, make it somehow easier to fit into your day or, you know, somehow that you don't have to like think about it, take all those steps, force yourself all by yourself. Uh, that's hard. It's hard for everybody. Gammon, were you gonna chime in? I was just gonna say that there are also some online classes that you can join in real time. So I know like the St. Louis APDA has some classes that are broadcast live and they're also recorded. So if it doesn't fit into your day, you know, in your schedule, you can consume it at a later time. Um, so I think, you know, taking advantage of technology and not just classes, but also devices that will track your activity and help you to see, are you meeting your goal for 
number of steps per day or number of minutes of activity per day and things like that. I know I'm very goal oriented. So I like to get the little badge that says I've done it for these many days in a row and those kind of things. And you can also get the social piece of that as well by inviting your friends who have a similar tracking device and seeing how they're doing and sort of making a little friendly competition. Right. Right. I think somebody, Mel, somebody just wrote in and said, you know, but what about now with COVID, you know, and these group exercise programs? So obviously that has changed. You know, right now people are not going to the same classes they were going to before because of the social distancing requirements, et cetera. But like Gammon said, there's a lot of, you know, exercise programs that are available online, either recorded or in real time. And you can still walk outside and you can walk with somebody six feet apart. You know, so there are ways, you know, to get it done. It just requires a little more creativity. Yeah, absolutely. I was actually talking to Davis Finney this morning and he had just gotten off a dance for PD class. And he said, you know, even though I'm not there, this class does the best job of making me feel like I'm in the room. And so yeah. part of it is going to be doing a little research and trying out a few things. And, you know, maybe the first couple of classes over Zoom you don't like, it doesn't feel like you're connecting in another way, but the third one does. And so be willing to kind of check out uh, what you can do. Um, before I get to the sort of the latest research and, and devices and that kind of thing, uh, how much is too much exercise? How do you know? <laughs> I don't know that any of us have a, uh, by, you can tell by the hesitation that it have a, a really definitive answer for that. Uh, I can speak to like a, a resistance training type of model that uh, the intent of resistance training obviously is to increase muscle strength. If, uh, if somebody's doing uh, weights and they're having increasing muscular pain uh, that's building over time and they're either uh, they're probably decreasing their ability to do the amount of resistance that they have. That's an adverse response. That's not something that they should continue to do without some guidance from, from someone else. Because uh, uh, that's moving in the wrong direction. And there's potential for tendon injuries and muscular injuries uh, or just overdosing the exercise. I think that's why it's so important to increase exercise gradually. You don't want to go from you know, no exercise to, you know, 60 minutes of high intensity exercise, right? Uh, that's going to be, you know, that could result in injury. And um, so just gradually increasing the amount of physical activity and engagement in exercise can prevent some of that. But, you know, what's too much for one person might be just right for someone else. So it really comes back to that, you know, it depends on the individual depends on all the other medical problems they have, or if any, and you know how the exercise is best uh, tailored. So there's not just a hardcore, oh, don't go over this amount. You know, it depends on the person. Yeah, and I think the important thing is if you, if you exercise really, really hard, the next day you get up and you are in pain, you can't exercise, you've probably done too much. Yeah. Because the Parkinson's is a day, it's a daily, uh, thing that you're dealing with, right? So, and all the movement every day is going to add up and it's also going to help you in that moment and hours after. So if you're finding yourself having to skip days, you're better off, you know, tapering it back a little bit on those other days. So you don't go too far because yeah. uh, over time, it's going to be what you can do every single day. That's going to be the most important thing that's going to. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I just want to say something about, you know, Obviously, doing something every day is great, but if you miss days, you got to take the long view. You know, I mean, this is Parkinson's. This is over years and years, right? And so, you know, there's 365 days in a year. There's multiple years pulled together. So it's like if you miss, you know, a day or two here and there each week, it's okay. Because if you get at the end of that year and you have 365 days and you've exercised I don't know, I'm going to make up half of them. Well, great. That's a lot better than nothing. Right. And that's, that's going to help the situation. So it's like, do the best you can and don't, don't kind of, um, 
be too hard on yourself if you took a day off or you missed a day or you went on vacation or you were sick or whatever it was. Just get back on. You know, the next day is a new day. Just get back on, you know, back on track. And then the outcome will be much better in the long, the long haul. Okay. Uh, so we are just about out of time. I would love to know from each of you, is there something that you, uh, aside from the Sparks 3 study, which we talked about already and we're super excited about, anything that's really, that you're looking forward to in the world of PT and Parkinson's that you wanna tell other people about or anything that I didn't ask that you wanted to um, talk about real quickly before we leave? Lee, do you wanna go first? Uh, I'm going to uh, call out uh, Gammon and Terry. I think the uh, current project that they have going on that uh, is focusing on exercise, but uh, but they're focused on trying to maximize that self-efficacy uh, for individuals, finding ways to improve a person's uh, sense of control over the disorder and ability to impact the disorder. And I think that's a really novel and important approach for a variety of uh, chronic conditions. And I think that I'm excited to see what the results of that will be. Thank you. Lee? I'm sorry, Terry. Yeah, I mean, thanks, Lee. That's great. You know, uh, Gammon and I are doing a study in which we're, we're trying to help people who are having a hard time exercising enough, who want to be doing more. And so, you know, you can feel free to reach out to us if you're interested in that. Um, but I think, you know, it's, you know, what's exciting is that exercise is getting so much attention and there's a lot of studies and a lot of trials going on. And actually Lee is doing a study right now looking at home cycling. So that's perfect during COVID, you know, uh, where you exercising at home is, is more the norm, but, you know, just like if you think about, um, you know, the way that drug studies operate, you know, in order to really know how to best utilize a drug, you have to know the right dose and the right kind of drug for the right kind of symptom. And so that's where we're at with exercise now. We're really trying to understand like, well, what kind of exercise and what effect does it have on the brain and how much should you do? And, you know, and it's exciting that we have all these studies going on right now that are helping us understand that more. Thank you. Gammon? I would just say that there are a lot of studies underway, but we already know exercise is helpful. So don't wait for the perfect evidence. Get out there and do whatever it is that brings you joy in movement and stick with it. Great, thank you. Well, thank you, Lee and Terry and Gammon so much for this great webinar. I know that our, our community absolutely loves all things related to PT. So really appreciate you taking the time today. Everybody will send you all of the links and all of the videos and recordings and a whole lot of information about some of the things that they talked about today. We'll send you links so that you can get more information. Thank you everybody. And we will see you again soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.